OK. Thank you. So it is my pleasure to welcome members today to this <coughs> uh, meeting uh, of um, Child and Family Services Scrutiny Performance Panel. And it'll obviously the last meeting of this current council. Um, we've obviously got Chris in as well. And I think Peter Black might come in afterwards, but I'm not absolutely sure. I'd also like to add a warm welcome to the county member, Elliot, and all the officers are present as well. There's quite a lot to get through today, I have to say that, so um, I'm going to move through the early stages quite quickly, I hope. Item one is apologies for absence. Do we have any, Liz? No, we haven't received any, Chair. OK. Item two, do we have any disclosures of personal interest or of interest that people would like to make? I can't see anybody putting hands up for that, so we'll move on quickly to item three, the prohibition of whip votes and declaration of party whips. We'll get to item four, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. You've all had a chance to look at them. I've had a look at them myself. I couldn't see anything that I was concerned about with them. So unless anybody's got any comments, would somebody like to say that we can accept those minutes, please? Yeah. With them, Chair. OK, thank you very much. I saw Wendy's hand go up there, that's for sure. Thank you, Wendy. And I'm sure there were a couple of other voices there as well. If anybody's got any complaints, now's the chance to put your hand up and say you have. But it's a bit too late now because we've approved them anyway, I guess. But there we go. Item five is public question times. Do we have any questions, Liz? Uh, no, we haven't received any, Chair. It's about part of the course, I self. So we will move on <coughs> now to item six, which is a report on the, <coughs> the EXER report on child sexual exploitation. Um, members be aware that this inquiry was established back in 2014 as a result of what happened in <coughs> Rotherham at that time. And uh, Theresa May established the, the, <coughs> the committee to set up, which is now, which is just now reported in, uh, <coughs> I think it was in January this year or February this year, sorry. And we did look at when we could discuss it. It was a bit too soon for the February meeting, so we decided to bring it to this meeting. It is obviously a very important subject. It's something that we have looked at over the years. As members will be aware, over the last eight years, we've had a number of meetings where it's been discussed. Um, we haven't had the uh, presentation, uh, Julie, in time to, to uh, circulate it with the agenda. So I'm hoping in terms of presenting uh, this report, you can share the report with us on your screen and we'll work through it that way. And we let you go through that and then take questions. You can take we take the questions as in how you want to, whether you want to leave them to the end or as we go through. So I I I don't know if David wants to say anything in advance of this before I ask Julie to start the presentation. If you do I don't, I don't think so, um, Chair. Let's let's uh, let's hear from um, Julie and, and the presentation. OK, so then on that case, Julie, I'll hand over to you, if I may, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, and we um, we have Superintendent Eve Davidson from South Wales Police who, right. who um, can respond to any questions if uh, if asked. And also Kate Phillips from Education, who although education weren't invited to be part of the inquiry, they're obviously a key partner in helping us to um, deliver on this particular agenda in Wales, in Swansea, sorry. So I'll just pull up my presentation, if you just bear with me a moment. Why, I'll why you do that, I'll take the opportunity to welcome Eve and say my apologies for not doing it in the first place, and I'm pleased to have you as well with us, Kate. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councillor Hurd Williams. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. OK. That's on the screen as far as yeah, I'm just going to put it into a bigger um, mic. Can That's everybody fine. see that? That's good, thank you. Yeah, good. OK, so uh, the presentation and just to say that Damien Rees was hoping to be with us today because he was heavily involved in um, supporting the then head of service, Julie Thomas, in uh, contribute, Swansea's contribution inquiry, but unfortunately he's had a family bereavement and can't be with us um, today. So he sends his apologies, Chair. Um, but we've um, We've gone through and um, we're going to I'm going to take you through a, a bit of a journey to explain um, the focus of the inquiry, which, as you know, considers sexual exploitation. We want a six study areas randomly selected 
uh, and the intention was to obtain an accurate picture of current practice at a strategic level um, in terms of the sites that were chosen to contribute to the inquiry. Um, and the inquiry in particular stated that, that their view on this particular type of child sexual abuse, um, and this takes out place outside of the family, involves children being coerced, controlled, manipulated or deceived. Um, there are many exploited children sexually assaulted rape repeatedly over months or years, and the perpetrators are typically adult men acting together. And this is the inquiry in, in terms of what they stated in their published report. Um, I felt it was important to share with you the inquiry definitions because they differ from the definitions which we generally and have been consistently using, particularly in, in Wales, um, across Wales, and their definition of a network for the purpose of their investigation was two or more individuals, uh, whether or not uh, they were um, known or associated with one another, uh, and um, and that they, their, their definition was that the networks um, that are children are coerced, manipulated, deserved, and deceived into sexual activity with multiple abusers. This, well, on a later slide, I'll explain a little bit more about the difference and what the impact that has in terms of us being clear about our position in Swansea and how we're assured about the way that we were working at the time and have strengthened that working arrangement going forward. Um, some of the slides are quite busy. I'm not going to read them out line for line, but there are some key things to, to say about our observations of the report uh, that we fully support the recommendations. Um, but they chose cases from information that we provided to them of young people that we had identified as either at risk or having been victims of extrafamilial child sexual abuse, that they looked at children between 2015 and 2019, and, and um, that they did not speak directly to any young people from Swansea, nor any of the victims called to give um, evidence. And at no point does the report reflect um, in any in any way, really. There are a couple of references to the distance traveled, not just by the local authority, but um, the individual partners and our, uh, the way that we work together in partnership. Um, so the risk is that the recommendations won't fully reflect the current practice or the practice developments or highlight the issues that have already been addressed. Um, I just need to move the person that's in the bottom of my screen because I can't see. I can't do that, sorry. Um, and it's... Um, so the practice is evolving in line with the comments and observations being made uh, and we do accept that there is still work to be done but at the same time it's important that um, that you know and you hear about the practice and the improvements that have happened um, over that period of time. There we go. So the inquiry drew attention to the troubling um, continues of the checklist approaches to assessing child sexual exploitation. Uh, and, it, and it's and, and I totally agree and we can cover that, that, that the scoring risk is not a way to understand and then respond appropriately to risk. It has to be alongside um, a competent professional assessment so that we actually understand and explore the harm that the child has experienced. The inquiry refers to the concept of exchange, um, which might suggest that children had a choice um, and was an unhelpful distraction, uh, which we want the imperative is identifying all children harmed. So there's a, we felt that was not particularly helpful, um, but there is learning there in terms of what what the use of that term and 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 then not getting embroiled in that. Um, that the report recommends that the government um, and that that's both governments that would be UK and also Welsh government take steps to ensure child sexual exploitation is data is collected separately from criminal exploitation and other forms of um, sexual abuse and in a consistent way. Um, the frequent downgrading of actual harm to risk meant opportunities to investigate, disrupt and prosecute offenders were reduced, the report noted. Um, sorry, this, I'm going to have to try and just reconfigure my screen. That's it, done it. The, I've got somebody in the bottom, I therefore can't read what's in the bottom. <laughs> Apologies, right. Um, and the harm sexual exploited children experienced and the service response could be significantly different from that of victims of other forms of exploitation. Good practice in Swansea is important that we um, we acknowledge this uh, and, and and are proud of this. Is that the often hidden? We we recognise the um, exploitation, sexual exploitation against boys and young men in in Wales, and um, we anticipated that its contextual safeguarding pilot uh, had a wider brief on criminal exploitation that would enable it to identify more males at risk of sexual exploitation. So the the work that we've been doing with the University of Bedfordshire, the pilot that we've been running with them for a couple of years, um, along with other local authorities across um, England, 
um, has helped us to strengthen and further strengthen that approach. In 2020, we did um, a multi-agency um, systems review and, um, and that, what that stated was that identifying extra familial harm within current practice is better than the other sites that were looked at across the UK and, and we responded to this in a coordinated manner um, in Swansea and there were examples of successful disruption uh, and we had requested a number of um, child abduction warning notices, more commonly um, paraphrased as corns. And we've used passport markers, engaged with the national referral mechanism and communicated with housing services where there were properties of concern. So a good way of working together across multi agencies to disrupt uh, and also prevent activities um, and uh, children being at risk of and children being exploited. And there's positive practice noted in particular around our leaving care support. Um, where we actually continue to support children beyond their 18th birthday with specialist care. Oh, sorry, I've just um, lost you. If you just bear for me a moment. Oh, fine. Uh, right back. So I'm just going to give you a Swansea perspective of the findings and, and, and the response. And this goes into a little bit more detail about some of the key areas, um, some of which presented some worrying headlines in uh, local and national press. So as I said earlier, the inquiry definition of network is not one is one that they set and not a standard agreed definition. Um, and we uh, and in Swansea, we avoid referring to young people as a gang, but use the term a group that identify themselves as a gang. Um, so we, we try to avoid labelling and, and, and this is where the contextual element of how we work comes to the fore really and, and helps us to think about the context rather than the individual young people themselves. We do consider um, connected networks of young people when we respond to concerns of exploitation and the examples that they refer to are young people we had already identified as I said earlier. Um, and during the period of the inquiry, we um, identified, took protective steps and worked with police to protect young people from exploitation, um, sexual exploitation by organised networks and adults. Not as a result of the inquiry, but this is work that was underway and working with, particularly the police. And between April 21 and January 22, we've responded to individual and contextual needs of over 200 young people. So this ranges from the very early stages of preventative and work in particular. So, for example, using our youth workers to within communities and having direct conversations with young people right through to the other end of the continuum of need uh, where we know that they are being exploited or at risk. Um, and as part of this, we consider the connected adults and risks that they pose to others as well as the identified young person. So, for example, we do take time to do mapping to understand who's connected to who and also who's connected to places. Um, that's a real strength of our, of our multi-agency and contextual safeguarding approach. We now we are now able to record extra familial harm, um, and, uh, as well as the type of extra familial harm and abuse a child or young person has experienced, whereas we couldn't previously, and that's as a, a positive development of our recording uh, system and methodology. And in regards to the point that's made in the report about extra familial harm, for most referrals, there are multiple risks identified, um, not just the one particular um, primary risk of extra familial harm, because it's complex, as I'm sure you can appreciate. In terms of black and minority ethnic communities, um, what the report says is that the, our council was acutely aware of the low levels of reporting. Um, and we and we have introduced a cultural, culturally harmful behaviour worker that sits alongside our practice lead for child exploitation. Um, and we work closely with partner agencies such as East uh, and we invite them to strategy planning meetings as appropriate. And since 2021 and the introduction of our new uh, recording system, we're now capturing the ethnicity of victims of child sexual abuse more consistently and therefore able to pull out reports better than we could previously. And 2021-22, our data shows that we've seen higher numbers of young people from these communities being identified as at risk of extra familial harm. Um, and that culturally harmful support worker we have also based in the safeguarding hub, so in the front door, so when things come in, she's picking things up straight away and, and helping not only the families themselves, but also our workers to understand um, particularly cultural aspects of, of um, safeguarding and any harm that we think um, the children are suffering. Another big part of the report was victim, the language. Uh, and this is something we feel quite strongly about in Swansea, that we can confidently say that this is a priority for us back in 2019. And we've done a lot um, over the past, um, since then, 
and we continue to check what what the, the changes have introduced, the support we've introduced, the impact that that's having. So the training that we have in place, the guides that we have in place, we check through audits that appropriate language is being used. Um, and the, the VADA domestic abuse training includes training about victim blaming. And we've um, worked with local businesses to produce a video uh, by Bernardo's to tackle the victim blaming language. Uh, and this includes training to support um, local business to be more aware of exploitation and what signs to watch out for. Um, another aspect was um, missing children and their return home interviews. Um, there's currently a national piece of work underway supported by Welsh Government to create a standard practice for all Welsh authorities for when children go missing from outside of their home. So if a looked after child or young person is reported missing in Swansea, even if they're not one of our looked after children, they're from a different um, home authority, then Swansea, it's the same in every local authority, we have to, we will always undertake a strategy meeting. And our child missing exploited um, traffic team are working with Bernardo's and South Wales Police to develop a plan around this. Um, so we have weekly meetings set up. Um, between Swansea Child and Family, the police and Bernardo's and um, provide return home interviews to ensure people receive the right support at the right time. And I was looking at yesterday to see a video that um, we've just produced in partnership with South Wales Police that promotes the good practice that we have around our response, to our collective and indi excuse me, individual responses to missing children. And it's obvious that we have very strong partnership working in this area. Uh, and then we cor correlate our respective records to ensure that we, we're confident we've identified any risks of child exploitation or other forms of extra familial harm, um, including the consideration of key places and networks and related incidents. So we take a very rounded view of our worries and concerns and potential risks so we don't just focus on one aspect. So that then leads us to ensure that we consider appropriate actions. Another theme that came out through the report and one of the headlines that they focused on was children with disabilities. Um, and we've um, this has happened in Swansea. What we've done is we've got a very experienced practice lead who specialises in disability that's located at our front door that we call SPOC, our single point of contact. And this supports what matters conversations with the young person and she uses her understanding to inform interventions and actions with young people and their families. And she's working with staff in Spock and, and our early help service to upskill them and help them better understand the differences for children with disability that the children with disabilities experience. It's very important that we focus on understanding um, their context uh, and their circumstances, and we don't make any assumptions. And really, really positively, our parent care forum has recently um, posted on their own Facebook page some positive um, comments in, reg in regards to those changes about how this integrated and senior social worker posts is having a positive impact on ensuring families of disabled children receive the right support at the right time. And they've been hearing positive feedback themselves about that change. So I think that's a really good testament to um, the positive impact of that change in listening to families and children um, from families who have disabilities. Um, so the partnership working, the inquiry um, highlighted that um, the CIW found in 2018 that um, generally our partnership working is effective, um, but we could, um, and we know that, and I'm sure Kate will chip in at the end, but they commented on the relationship between ourselves and education could be strengthened, and I'm happy and confident to say that it has been strengthened and it continues to be strengthened, and we have many good examples of how that is, uh, continues to be so in, in relation to how we work together. Um, on many on many themes, not just um, exploitation and contextual safeguarding. And the council's practice lead on child exploitation speaks on a daily basis uh, with the supervisor of the police's exploitation team, uh, and they have an extremely close working relationship. And uh, the video, which should be published soon on YouTube, is testament to that. I think when you see that, um, they're working in action to promote that partnership working. Um, and we work with lots of agencies across lots of sectors and we coordinate lots of responses, um, particularly those which target the social conditions of harm um, so that we, we make the changes needed to create safety. And I think we've um, one of the things that we've promoted and we're very proud of is our uh, contextual and missing exploitation and trafficking um, meetings that we set up, which aims to prevent exploitation and disrupt criminal networks. Um, so we have a panel and in its first year it considered 50 referrals uh, and 25 agencies have attended together to understand and tackle those concerns um, by reducing risk and building on the strengths of the area. Um, 
And the, in relation to building on that, could touch on missing the exploitation of traffic. We do peer mapping to, to as I said earlier, to identify connected networks. Uh, we've worked with the police in terms of um, looking at organised criminal networks and how we respond to those um, with a child focus through a child focus lens. Um, and we're taking steps to protect young people and support the police when they're looking at disruption activity so that they can um, undertake their criminal processes uh, in the way that they need to as necessary. Um, at the moment, there's been no shared agreement of terminology across social care and police for recording this form of harm, um, which, which may have created discrepancies in recording, but not in our responses. But we are now working with the police to ensure that we can have some agreed um, terminology about how we individually record this information in our system so that when we look at reports and pull them together, we both talk in the same language. Um, so in terms of um, how we audit, review and, and, and undertake improvements through performance, um, the inquiry said it didn't receive a reliable picture from the six case study areas and we accept that in that period, 27 to 19, our information systems were limited. Um, so that limited our impact and our ability to capture information for, inf for improvement purposes. Um, but through our participation in the University of Bedfordshire's um, three-year contextual safeguarding pilot, that's really been an opportunity to do redesign and improve our response to child exploitation. And through the implementation of our new system, that's also enabled us during 2021 to redesign how we record and report on extra familial harm. And we've now produced, we've just um, most recently produced an annual report for exploitation, um, which is going through the sign off processes um, and, and chair that may be something that you might be interested to bring to scrutiny at some point in your new work programme. Um, but what that said was from April 20 went to on to present, there have been six referrals where there have been concerns of criminal and sexual exploitation. So evidence in that we are differentiating and also considering the different types of harm. Um, and as I would repeat what I said, but about the report, but there'll be a quarterly and an annual report going forward from this um, new annual report we've just produced. And really, really importantly, listening to what matters to young people. So we've um, not only have we got an active junior safeguarding board for West Glamorgan, um, but our children's participation and rights officer spoke to young people and, and they talked to us about a variety of barriers for them in terms of disclosure and engagement and, and how they might may choose or, or prefer or feel safe, not choice, but about feeling safe to talk to adults and professionals about understanding that there are multiple options to support young people. And that's quite right because they should have choices and they have suggestions about who that could be, um, who could be involved with them in creating safety. Um, but there's a lot to do around, to do around the addressing the stigma of young people's needs with communities. And I think the best, one of the good ways to do that is working in partnership with young people and local communities together. And generally, young people perceive more welfare-led over punitive responses to be better from their perspective. And that evidence would show us that that will achieve, is more likely to achieve sustainable positive change that all aspects of the community can see and feel, not just young people themselves. And it's really important as a trusted adults, both professionals and wider community. And they really um, emphasise the importance of youth clubs from their perspective, these young people. Um, so as I said, um, I've already talked about how we identify young people at risk of sexual exploitation um, through a strategy discussion with the police. And we, we use the Welsh Government's current CSE guidance uh, and we remind partner agencies to use this. Our current training around this subject, child exploitation and child sexual exploitation, uses Welsh Government guidance to support our practice. Welsh Government guidance, however, have recognised that the current guidance uh, is not fit for purpose and it is being revised. Um, basically, it's um, it doesn't set out, it highlights pointers of practice rather than providing a bit of what we might call a process map or a workflow. Uh, and the Welsh Government is just about to launch a toolkit, which we'll adopt um, once that comes out um, to reassure everyone that we, we consistently follow the safeguarding procedures as set out. Um, and in those meetings, we look at peer and adult networks but we accept that there is more work to do to strengthen this practice and we're on that journey through the CMET operational um, work in particular and young people are being involved as part of their safeguarding reviews so they can take part indirectly if they choose to do so their statutory safeguarding reviews primarily for those children who are looked after that's actively encouraged so the final section um, I, want, I wanted to show you today was how we're taking forward the findings and recommendations in Swansea from that ICSA report 
And this is primarily linked to the um, strategic CMAC group, uh, which is in place and meets um, very regularly and is chaired by Damien, Damien Rees from Swansea Child and Family Services. Um, so I've, I've, I've mentioned the, uh, the toolkit, which is used to be published, so we'll be looking to embrace that. A lot of really positive work on um, LGBTQ, um, I should add plus there. I met myself with some of the colleagues with the group of young people who have been doing some work around this on behalf of the Junior Safeguarding Board. And they have some really um, um, good and positive ideas about how they see we can engage better and differently with that group, and particularly around providing safe spaces. Um, so we are working in partnership with the YMCA uh, around this area and we are continuing and we'll continue to engage with young people around this and we've had some feedback, that, that, that's the one I just mentioned, um, uh, around um, working with those young people and they've really welcomed the opportunity to engage and have their views listened to and that's something we plan to continue with both at a safeguarding board level and at a um, CMET Swansea level. In terms of disability, um, we've got a multi-agency working group under development that will help us to be, um, improve how we identify and respond and also will um, help us to provide and ensure the information that we give to parents and carers helps them to recognise the signs and provide some um, educative work to them and develop some guidance to support social workers and the parent care forum has welcomed these developments. We are committed to co-producing um, in all areas of our work uh, with uh, parents, carers, children and people. And this is just another example of how we've co-produced this uh, our response uh, and not worked on this in isolation. And we're in the early stages of setting up a working group around uh, BAME communities, which will include, very importantly, young people, as well as representatives from local communities and part. Data we know needs to be strengthened. I mentioned the report that we've just produced and we are working with the police to develop a shared data set and also think about and look at how we can create some auditing mechanisms, so some checks and balances, looking at practice, looking at our responses so we can pull out the assurance we can report into the appropriate bodies that we are continuing and consistently applying the right guidance and, and uh, looking at the right things and most importantly delivering the best outcomes for our children and people. So strategic CMET has got an important role to play here to oversee this piece of work and pull everything together and get everybody on the same page. Uh, we are now able to collect data based on sex, ethnicity and disability, so we can now report on that consistently. Um, and we, in terms of, um, we are looking to set up some form of youth panel um, in response to listening to young people and the young people we've spoken to are very keen to be involved and continue to be engaged in that. Uh, I thought it's important to share with you uh, evidence of our making a progress from an external body, which is um, Durham University, Dr Rachel Owens, um, in terms of developing architectural safeguarding approach. Um, and we've engaged wholeheartedly in this uh, with a critical reflective process that the project has demanded. And, and what she said is that we've executed a vision for making radical changes to the structure and offer of services to increase safety for young people. And we're now in a strong, positive place to embed this into our practice as usual. That's the end of my presentation, Chair. I'll just um, come back to you and stop sharing my screen. So hopefully. And I just wanted to say that um, I only had the Welsh translated version about 10 minutes before scrutiny started. So sadly, I didn't have time to cut and paste it into the presentation. Um, so apologies for that, but it, it was just the timings just didn't coincide effectively. Thank you, Chair. You're on mute, Paxton. Paxton, you're on mute. Chair. Sorry, my apologies. I put myself on mute, didn't I? I didn't mean to do that. But uh, in essence, what I was saying, Judy, I think you deserved a sip of water after that because it was quite a tour de force. There's uh, a lot of information there. I don't know if anybody else wants to come back in. Um, in terms of that, first of all, before I start asking people if they want to have any questions, whether Eve wants to say something or Dave wants to say something. In that case, or do it. From Eve. Um, thanks. thanks. Thanks for the uh, presentation, um, Julie. It was uh, uh, comprehensive, but necessarily com comprehensive given the uh, you know the, the the nature of the report that we received 
I suppose I would acknowledge um, Paxton or, or just further reflect on that early, one of the earlier slides where, um, you know, just that clarity around lo local authorities were picked at random for, uh, you know, to be a part of the uh, inquiry, you know, deliberately um, so, but to give a spread of the types of local authorities that there are across um, the UK so that the inquiry could um, uh, focus on, uh, you know, learning for all local authorities. Um, you know, it is very, you know, it's ab ab absolutely as I would have expected that scrutiny have again come back to this issue, as you've acknowledged, you've 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 focused on in the past. You know, it would be my expectation that given the nature of the report and that the learning was intended to be for all local authorities, that all local authorities would be going through a similar um, exercise. But, you know, just acknowledge I'm, I'm pleased that um, um, scrutiny, as I always would have expected, are giving, you know, proper robust you know, attention to this and, and thank Julie again and, and Damien, who wasn't able to be here and colleagues um, for all the work that they have pulled together. OK, thank you, David. So you did you want to come in? Yeah, I was just going to mirror really what David said, you know, uh, excuse my um, innocence. I've been in post for almost three weeks, but I was fully aware of this from my previous role. But I think, you know, for Swansea, this was a welcomed um, report. I think it gives us an opportunity to uh, raise good work that's already ongoing. And I think it was really important um, in the presentation that you mentioned about the good points. There are lots of good work undergoing at this time and that was uh, identified but also you know some improvements and lots of learning to be made and in terms of contextual safeguarding and you know as David stated you know it, it involves us here right now but obviously it's relevant to other areas which is vitally important but you know very much welcome and th thank you Judy. I did manage to meet with Damien prior to this meeting, but sadly he couldn't be here today. But yeah, from a policing perspective, obviously we acknowledge the report, we acknowledge the findings, we're working towards making some headway in terms of the learning identified and action planning um, to respond to that, which is obviously going to improve the situation. Um, but some good points raised as well, which I think is key. OK, thank you, Eve. I will start now. Asking people if they want to ask questions. I've got three hands up at the moment. I'm going to start with Erica because you were the first one to put your hand up, Erica. Over to you. There you go. Sorry, can't, well, so, sorry about that, Chair, um, with the mute. Um, right. Um, it's such a huge subject. I really appreciate the work that's been going on here. And um, we're in the here and now, really. So um, I don't particularly want to go back, but we needed to go and learn what what was needed to be done. Um, many of us have got children and grandchildren, and um, not every child is safe. I think that the safeguarding we do is good. Um, it's as good as we can do at the moment, I think. But um, I think. Um, there are families out there going through child sexual abuse and not knowing where to go or what to do about it. Um, I'm really pleased that the attitudes changed because I wasn't happy with some of the slides, the earlier slides. Um, no, no child it um, takes part in this. This is all about grooming and um, uh, and. Uh, just disturbant. So I'm really pleased to pick that up. Um, I, I don't know what else to say, but um, I think we've still got a lot of work to do. And I know you're all working really hard on this issue because it's not just um, outside, it's inside the family. And um, how we address that, I think we, we've got some steps to make there. Um, some will come forward and I can guarantee majority don't. I was talking to a lady today on International Women's Day a bit late and she opened up and said she'd been sexually abused by her grandfather. 
So it's it's that sort of scenario that I'm looking, how do we get into that? Um, but I can see we're on the path because we're looking at it and it's on the table. So um, I just want to thank you all very much for what you're doing. Um, it's important and it will make a huge difference to these children's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, Mike, I was the next one person to have his hand up, so Mike Day. Yeah, thank you, Paxton, and um, thanks for the presentation, Julie, a very comprehensive overview, and I think we're all uh, somewhat assured by the um, measures that uh, have been put in place and are being put in place. As I suppose, basically, I would be concerned, as most other people would be, in terms of um, the outcomes. Um, are we confident that we've got um, as much in place as possible to identify and deal with these cases? Um, are cases actually um, coming forward, which we may not have expected in the past? And I suppose just linked in with that is that um, do you feel that, you know, I've noticed that this uh, review took place over 2015-19, uh, just before COVID. Has COVID actually um, caused further problems for us rather than um, uh, helped in the situation. I'm just conscious of the fact, for example, of, um, with uh, the lockdown, um, Kate would sure would be able to come in on this, but um, that uh, children have not been in school and uh, whether that's actually exacerbated the, the, the problem uh, in this particular area. So just a couple of comments, if I may, on that. OK, thanks, Mike. Uh, do you want to come back on that, Judy? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, what I would, would say on the outcomes question, Mike, is that um, we the drive is to focus on once we've understood and, and, and thought about the risks, um, it's very, very much child focus. It's, and then it's focused on what matters that child. So safety will naturally come first, but then it's looking beyond that and thinking about how the journey that that child can go on to achieve, be the best they can be. And that's where the multi-agency working comes into its full. So it's a working in partnership. So it could be around health and well-being. It could be around education. It could be around community safety. But it's on how we have a team around that child or, or as a group of children. So we're working with groups of children as well um, in different settings. It could be an education setting or a community setting. We've got two that are quite active at the moment in those in that regard. And it's very much focused on their outcomes, but also um, helping them to think to be ambitious in their outcomes and, and looking forward and beyond. And that's where I think our frontline workers come to the fore and having those really active dialogues with individuals. So um, I would say yes, very much I'm confident that we do very much focus on outcomes um, once we've once we're confident we've we've adequately addressed the risk. I would say, um, and and the, um, I, th I say that we um, things are being referred in. We, we, we're very busy, as Eric as Eric noted. Um, but what I would say is that I'm, you know, we'll never know whether everything's coming in because sometimes it's just about people feeling feeling safe to come forward. But what we do have is a really good relationship with through the CMET operational group where people share what's probably termed intel. So things that they've come across or spotted or seen in a community and what the operational group offers is an opportunity to share all of that and gives you a really different picture and different perspective which you can then take action on to take forward um, in some form or another. And that will also assist the police perhaps in, in what they're doing. Uh, that then They can't necessarily share the detail of their operations, but we can sort of share low level information that will assist each other. Um, impact of COVID is interesting. I would say that the initial impact was probably that um, there was a, some of the risks were removed because people weren't allowed out and about. So some of the stuff around exploit criminal exploitation perhaps um, reduced, but then we perhaps moved there was more online exploitation that we were aware of. So we had to rethink um, our approach and, uh, and our. So the, I would say we've got quite a dynamic approach. Therefore. Um, so we, we're thinking about what that what that and so now people are out and about more um, then that means the forms of exploitation have perhaps um, changed again. So it's really important for us to continue to share all that information so we don't um, sit on our laurels, so to speak, but we stay alive to that the changing picture and, and understand how young people are thinking and feeling. Um, and, and and what may be causing them to be pulled into um, those forms of exploitation. And that then helps us to think about the adults and their world as well. So that, uh, thanks, Chair. OK, thanks, Yuri. Uh, Yvonne, you got your hand up? Yes, I have. Thanks, Chair. Um, and I've got a few questions. I hope that's OK. 
Okay, yes. um, I'd like to thank Julie for the report and um, agree with a lot of what Dave and Eve have said. But um, we talk about what matters to the child, if I start with that, and, and obviously what matters to the child is important. But I feel we often overlook the fact that, especially if it's a familial issue, or even if it isn't, for some parents, for some family, they're not going to want to report this. So the child is obviously going to be doing what, what the parents want. And if it's a family member, my, my experience is the child is often thinking, if I complain, if I follow this up, everyone knows about this. But if I say, mom or dad, whichever it is, uncle, brother, is going to be sent away. Mom's going to be unhappy with me. So I think sometimes we need to, yeah, take into account what the child thinks, feels, want, but realise we have to do what's ultimately the best for the child. My other thing is that you talk, we talked, um, or the report talked about on uh, the council, we have um, work in partnership with East um, to cover Black, Asian, ethnic minorities. And for me, East is one organization. And I know that we can't work with everyone, but East work with one sector of the BNE community. And so I often feel, and I've said this, and I keep saying this, um, it's not a true representation. So how do we hear the voice of other people, other communities? And I know later on, we spoke about, um, we're, we're in, in, in the process of setting up a, a group for the BAME community. Who, who is going to be on that? Because often it is people who are already um, aware, reading, singing the hymn sheet. The people that are really being in need are not on these communities. And my last thing is, um, while we keep, and, and if you speak to the communities, if, if we keep having the BME community, the ethnic community, the white community, we're going to remain um, scattered. And, and for me, social services, yeah, you have to take into account the person doesn't have the language or whatever, but what, you, what we need to start doing is you have a person in front of you, it's irrelevant um, to a large extent their ethnicity or their colour, because that just adds to the, I don't want to deal with social services, because I'm not, I'm not white, I'm not British, they don't, they don't care. Not that they don't understand, they don't care. And before I really get going, I'm going to end there. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Thank Thanks, Julie. Thank Julie, before I bring uh, Kate back in, please. Do you want to come back, Julie? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Sue. There's, there's a really um, strong and relevant relevant point. See, um, I, I don't disagree with the point you made about the abuse in the home. Obviously, the, the reports about abuse that takes place outside of the home. Um, but in relation to abuse that takes place in the home, you're absolutely right, children are scared to come forward. Um, and, and what we know is that when children feel safe, and a lot of times that's when they're in school, that's when they'll start to tell people. And it's really important that we take a very sensitive approach to helping children to, to work through that. Um, at the same time, then um, helping them to feel continue to feel safe. So you're absolutely right as our approach on that. Um, in terms of, although that's not the feature in this report, but it is really important for, for children and families in relation to how we take that forward, not just as social services, but as, as multi-agencies. Um, in terms of people on, on the group, I'm not aware that it's been determined. Very happy for you to offer any suggestions on that, Yvonne. And you're absolutely right, we can't just hear one voice. It needs to be multiple voices because no one organisation can ever represent all communities. So totally agree with you on that point. Um, so we haven't got any any answers um, to that. Um, and I was going to say something on your last point, but it's just gone out of my head. Um, but um, sorry, forgive me. But um, yeah, some, some really valid points. Happy to have a separate conversation with you, Yvonne, if that would help. And 
really good for you to inform our working. I know what it was. Yes, we should look at the person, um, not their their colour or their gender. Um, but you'll note that in that report, there's a real drive on on on, look, on on saying that we must collect data around this. But our worker in the front door helps us to understand different cultures because I think that is really really important. Because if you if you that's where unconscious bias can come to the fore because you can make assumptions about families based on your own experiences. It's important that we do understand other people's lived experiences, whether that's around culture or gender or, or whatever it might be. So that I, I sort of agree with what you said. We should focus on the person, but it's important we understand their context and their lived experiences and their background, whatever that might be. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Julie, and I think something that you said there in terms of education and the school and the identification in the school needs, needs nicely into Kate. So would you like to come in, Kate? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. I just actually wanted to come uh, and respond to Councillor Day in relation to the COVID uh, uh, closures and um, just to kind of give a bit of information around that, if that's OK. It was, um, you know, as you've identified, a really difficult time. And actually what was what was harder than those very, very strict um, lockdowns and closure periods were the periods of reopening when we had um, partial opening of schools or where we had periods of time where year groups of children would, would be out of school. I think that was a time for us when the partnership working um, with Chan and family and with other colleagues, police as well, was really critical um, and became hugely beneficial in terms of how we supported um, children and young people. So, uh, you know, a couple of examples of that where we were able to develop very quickly um, a very effective system to monitor some of our most vulnerable children and young people and able to get a shared understanding and a shared assessment across all services through that partnership working. Um, we were also able to develop quite quickly a response um, through our blended learning and check-in approaches, um, which enabled us to give children and young people a, a point of access with, with a trusted adult. So that, you know, obviously would be a school um, a member of staff, but not necessarily a teacher, perhaps a partial support worker. Um, but we did that very much in partnership with our colleagues in child and families so that because we were very mindful that some of those conversations that might develop could, could be quite difficult or challenging. We wanted to be sure that because the access to children and young people was limited, we had um, a really clear uh, pathway for those those children. Um, and I guess that the final part of that that we thought was really beneficial was during the periods of reopening of society then um, where place different places became quite challenging for some children and young people and shared intelligence between uh, schools, child and family services, youth workers, police enabled us to really um, work collaboratively to target interventions. And there was a really, I think, one of the first uh, CMET um, interventions was, a, you know, a, a good example of that. And it was a very, very effective shared multi-agency process that has led to further work that's been developed and offered to schools. So, you know, it was a really, diff it was a really difficult time, um, but it did help us develop some of those partnerships, which I think were were quite effective. OK, thank you, Kate. Um, Mike, you have a question or comment? Mike? Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Julie. Uh, that was very thorough and very detailed. Um, but when, whenever I have to study or, or think about child sexual exploitation, I always feel generally upset because um, because of my experience working on the front line in Swansea with social services, some of my colleagues, and I have to deal with very difficult situations as colleagues do have to today. So th this is about, for me, I think, about where the solutions lay, not specific solutions, but what, how do we keep on top of the problems? And I think that um, uh, absolutely, Julie said, we mustn't rest on our laurels. You know, we, we should, as Sir, Sir William Attin said in his high level report in the 1990s, we've got to avoid complacency at all costs. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of being part of this committee in particular as uh, our chairperson, Paxton says repeatedly we were in very challenged times years ago, uh, built out of them and we've been diligent in keeping our eye on the ball. But let's not forget the evil maliciousness of the mind of the abuser. And, and that's the challenge. I think some of the most successful interventions I've seen is reflecting what Julie said about multi-agency and community as of critical importance. Some of the most successful interventions 
have occurred in my experience when communities and we, we, we mustn't take a scattergun approach. We have to go to communities when communities understand the mind of the abuser, when community understand what abuse looks like, when community understands evil intent, because the abuser usually comes with a smile on his face and a, a pocket full of cigarettes or, or, or money. You know, that's the reality of it. And and I think I, I'd ask Julie about the current position. I don't know if you know this, Julie, perhaps it's an unfair question. I don't know, but I know that that for years, Social services have promoted um, a faithful foundation training um, linked to the Stop It Now campaign, Lucy Faithful's Foundation, uh, which is about understanding the minds of, of the offender and, and the cycle of offending and what we can do about it to keep our children safe. And I mean our, I mean corporately our children. So what what are we are we looking to cascade training or continue that kind of training? And how are we exploring community links to try to get more people aware of the way that malicious adults look at vulnerable children and young people? Mike, Julie? In terms of um, the detail around the training, Mike, I, I, for staff in particular and multi agents, I, I can certainly share. I, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but we do refresh through the safeguarding board and locally. Um, our training our training and development offer for staff, both on a multi-agency and our own agency basis. Um, in relation to communities, you're absolutely right. Um, and I, I would say that the approach that we're taking through, um, the, particularly the youth service, going out and, and working, not just the youth service, but partner agencies, particularly housing and the police and local schools. I think there's huge opportunities there to take that approach of helping communities understand and recognise uh, and what what to look out for. Um, so so I, I think that, that's not I think I know that's something that we're very passionate about building upon and I'm very passionate about working with communities uh, and and our young people in particular um, working in partnership with communities so that we help to um, I really hopefully remove some of the stigma about a young person's behaviour and and why that might how how it's perceived by communities, but also how young people perceive their community. I think there's lots of strengths we can build upon that can help these young people flourish and help our communities to be safer. Um, so um, I can't give you much detail, but all I can say is that we're very committed to working together on that going forward. Um, thanks, Joe. Okay, thanks, Julie. You want to add to that, Jay? Yeah, if it's okay, just to support Julie really, and just to sort of share with everybody, there is a slight interlink around the assessment of sexualized risk. Um, and I just want to sort of update everybody within the Youth Justice Service, and Julie and I have had a number of conversations. We're actually going to be commissioning um, AIM-3 sexualized risk assessment training specifically for the Youth Justice staff to support child and family, but actually we will be looking to roll that out at a much larger level across child and family. So just that you know, there is an interlink between the two, and Julie and I have obviously had this discussion already and uh, and we're going to be rolling that out so i just wanted to confirm that point mike and, and respond to you okay thanks jay um i'm not seeing any other hands going up at this point in time um basically as i see it the report was uh, put in place or this the uh, <coughs> inquiry was put in place basically because of what was criminal sexual exploitation as i understand it and that's mainly what they were supposed to be looking at i would understand i would expect but uh, obviously you have moved and taken this also to include familial uh, <coughs> sexual exploitation as well and obviously that is crucially important um i would like to say thank you very much julie to <coughs> to the report that you produced for us and also for the way you presented it and for answering your questions i just got one quick one just to show whether i was misunderstanding or not i seem to see um somewhere in there a, a figure of about six cases of this within the last 18 months in swansea is that was that correct yeah i think it was six of a particular type so it's just to i oh. think it was part of um attempting to provide some assurance that we were very alive to this issue and able to record it in in the way that we can then report on it rather than it being lost in the data system um yeah I was just wondering what the overall sort of incidence of it is and are we satisfied that it's going down in the right direction, I think. I, I guess that's a bit of a, um, a 
conundrum for us, isn't it really? Because what we, I think what we, what we want to be is confident that it's been um, not only recognised and spotted, but it's been reported. And you might say that it being reported is a positive indicator. Um, that then means we're then more aware of um, what communities are at risk or individuals or groups of individuals are at risk. Um, so what, what I would perhaps suggest is if, if we brought that broader um, report around the performance data that we have, we could perhaps unpick that at a future meeting to understand, so you have an understanding of our understanding of the picture across Swansea um, and, and what's that saying about our communities and the risks in relation to exploitation. OK, thank you very much. I think that probably brings that section of the agenda to the end. If I can move on to item seven, which is a presentation on the Youth Justice Inspection Report. Again, there is a report which I'm hoping Jay will be able to share with us. We didn't have it in time, unfortunately, to be able to circulate it with the agenda. But at this point in time, Jay, I will hand over to you and hopefully um, you will share that with us and we will go through the report. Thank you. Thank you, Paxton. And just to say good afternoon to everybody. Um, I hope to make this uh, as quick and painless as possible for you. So I'll be bringing up a presentation. I hope that's OK. Bear with me. This is the technology bit. I hope I get it sorted and you can see it. Hang on, bear with me. OK, is that coming through? Can you see that? Yeah, that looks fine. Lovely stuff. OK, I'll just move that into um, slide mode. Super duper. OK, is that OK? Can everybody yeah. see that? That's fine. Thank you. OK, so just before I start, I just sort of wanted to remind everybody that we've been on a, a three year improvement journey and obviously scrutiny have been part of this process with this. Uh, and just to sort of remind everybody, the, the last inspection took place uh, in October 2018. Uh, and at that point, we were uh, we obviously received uh, an inadequate rating. Uh, I, what I'd just like to focus on and just sort of confirm with everybody is that we've made significant improvements over the three year period. And obviously, I'm delighted to sort of confirm with everybody that we've moved from an inadequate rating to a requires further improvement rating, which is a, is a big success for the service. So that's really the first thing I wanted to emphasize that uh, we've made massive strides in terms of uh, kind of addressing the initial concerns and I'm really pleased that we've made this progress. What I thought would be really helpful today, if it's okay with everybody, is to just run through some of the essential components of the inspection so that everybody on scrutiny can have a bit of an understanding of that. And then my best hopes will be is I'll talk to you about the next steps and then the action and improvement plan that we've got in place. I hope that's okay. That's fine. Lovely. OK, so just in terms of the contents today, I'll be going through the ratings, some of the key findings, some recommendations and then the next steps. OK, so as I've already highlighted, the, the most important bit to obviously share with everybody is we've made massive improvements and we've now moved on to a requires improvement uh, sort of rating. Just to sort of confirm, really, I think we recognise as a service that we're on a continuous improvement journey and that we're working towards that. So from our perspective, there's always going to be an opportunity to, to see learning and developments and things that we need to be taking forward. But I think um, I think it's just really important that we take a reflective approach about this. But obviously, just to sort of share with you, um, the inspectorate uh, carry out an inspection, but it's divided into key sections. So what I'll be doing is going through each of the key sections with you. So the first section they um, they um, inspected was around organisational delivery, and this specifically looks at what you'll see on the table. And I'll hopefully if you can see my mouse, I'll highlight. So 1.1 is around gov governance and leadership. So that's primarily about the, the management board. Then it's about the staff partnerships and the services that are available in our partnership working and then information and facilities available to staff, to children and young people. As you'll see, um, we had a fairly good uh, assessment here. So you'll, what you'll see on, the, you know, on that section is that under um, the staffing section, we had a good, but in some of the areas, unfortunately, we had some required improvement. But on the whole, it was still very, very positive. OK, so the key findings for that one. Uh, the strengths were that it was supportive and proactive board and detailed performance reporting. Uh, since that time, we'd had an improved health offer, so that included the development of um, CAMS. So we now have a CAMS post in place and we have a regional speech and language service. Um, and, and then there was evidence of improved supervision, staff development and training. So clearly we've got good systems in place for supervision and staff feel supported. The improvements, however, that were picked up on were disproportionality and diversity not being recognised as a key priority. Uh, and what I would just like to point out is we're already working towards developing a, a disproportionate 
proportionality local policy response to this uh, and and obviously what we've now started to do and i'll talk to you about this a little bit further in terms of the action and improvement plan um, we have now set up some champions within the service to drive this particular bit of the improvement journey forward one of the other comments that was made that staff felt a little bit unclear about the parameters of prevention and they felt a little bit that their uh, the morale was uh, slightly fragile uh, Helen and I have met with the team. We've had a recent staff development session and sort of talked about these particular issues. And I think some of these uh, um, these points were being raised, particularly at the time when COVID was taking place. So I imagine it was a particularly challenging time for staff, but specifically around the parameters of prevention. We've been obviously going through quite a change process and we've been supporting the contextual safeguarding approach. And I think there are a number of changes going on with the service, which the team were, were adapting to and adjusting to. So understandably, there were some aspects which I think uh, we needed to support them along the change journey on. One of the last bits is obviously just about communication between uh, staff and board not always effective. Uh, I, I'm proud to sort of say that actually in our board, we do invite staff to board meetings um, at every board meeting and they do have an opportunity to talk to board members. I think there's probably a little bit more work uh, to do with staff to ensure that we are reflecting all of the issues maybe that they felt they were experiencing, but it's an ongoing piece of work. OK, so the next section then is court disposals. Uh, this was a positive section for us. So under uh, 2.1, uh, our assessment skills were particularly good. Planning was uh, slightly not not as good and we needed to improve under that area. Implementation and delivery was good and the reviewing function was outstanding. So we had an outstanding under that particular area. So confident that our court disposal work is to a high standard. The key findings were that staff understand trauma informed practice and the impact of ACEs, that they have a good understanding of desistance and plan using strengths and protective factors, that children, parents and carers are involved in all the stages, which I'm obviously very pleased to know and confirm. Uh, the reviewing was frequent and proactive. However, we did need to improve our assessments around harm of, uh, sorry, assessment of harm to others and risk planning, including contingencies and risks to victims. And we'll cover that in the uh, action improvement plan in a little bit. OK, so the next section, and this was the area that was probably the toughest part for us, uh, was around out of court disposals. So at the time they assessed uh, or felt that the assessments, uh, the assessment side of the service in this particular area was inadequate. Um, and that planning was particularly inadequate, implementation and delivery was inadequate, and out of court disposal policy and provision required improvement. We'll touch on this when I come to the uh, action improvement plan. Sorry, can I can I ask a question if I may just? Of for course a you can. Of course what you can. What do you mean by out of court disposals? Okay, uh, Helen, are you able to sort of respond specifically to that part? Yeah, of course. Um, hi everybody. For those of you that don't know me, I'm I'm Helen Williamson, manager at the Youth Justice Service. Um, so just in answer to that question, out of court disposals are is the work that we do with young people who have been arrested for a first time, have entered, you know, have accepted responsibility for that. So they're, they're accepting that um, what they've done is wrong and they then come to our bureau, um, come through our bureau process, which is pre-court. So they don't go to court. They come through the bureau process, which is um, youth justice service staff and police led and we will work with that young person. They still get assessed. They have an intervention plan, and then that is agreed at Bureau with that young person. And we undertake that intervention with the primary aim of diverting them out of the system and hopefully that they don't reoffend and come through the court process. So I hope that that helps with the understanding. Yes, indeed, thank you. It's obviously uh, not been a part not being involved in this, I don't always understand what the terms mean. So no, no, and it's good that you've I asked the question. Back. It's it's really good that you've asked the question. So thank you for that. I think what's really important to stress here, and um, Helen and I on a number of occasions have talked about this, uh, just to be clear for uh, scrutiny that uh, when HMIP uh, come to inspect any service, their particular uh, ratings process. Uh, is based on a sample. So they'll look at a specific selection of cases that are related to this particular area 
and uh, they'll they'll carry out an assessment of that particular work. And what they do is uh, they'll assess, for example, a sample of say 10 to 15 cases, and they may decide that of the uh, 15 cases that maybe 10 of those were to a good enough standard, but then maybe five, for example, might not have been. And unfortunately, HMIP's focus is 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 usually if if a particular couple of cases aren't to that standard, then they will use that as the rating. So rather than giving an overall average rating, they will then focus on the cases where they're uh, the biggest areas for improvement or changes that need to be made. So unfortunately, that, that can prove to be quite challenging because it doesn't necessarily reflect um, the overall quality across the board. OK, I'm just going to move to the next section. So key findings, uh, so the strengths, assessments uh, regarding desistance and safeguarding were effective. Planning identified appropriate interventions, including restorative justice. Children, parents and carers are meaningfully involved, which again is very positive. Time skills are appropriate and followed. However, uh, diversity needed more consideration. And as we've talked about this earlier, uh, the concept or the theme of disproportionality is something that needs to be looked at across the service. Risk assessments and more information contingency arrangement arrangements needed to be uh, more robust. And the re Bureau requires appropriate senior uh, representation from the YJS for oversight and challenge. Just to quickly come to that, Helen now sits on the Bureau and represents the service. It gives us uh, uh, that additional uh, managerial oversight. And at the time of the inspection, we hadn't actually set up. Uh, there's a regional out of court disposal uh, uh, panel. It's a scrutiny panel, which funnily enough, Damien uh, sits on and chairs as an independent person. And we review all of our out of court disposal uh, cases through that panel process. And this enables us to consider uh, and reflect on whether or not there's anything that needs to be reviewed and any learning that needs to be taken forward. Unfortunately, that panel process wasn't in place at the time of the inspection. It was taking place. I think a couple of weeks after. So unfortunately, we just didn't have that particular process in place. And the other uh, improvement was performance analysis needed to be more in depth. I'm just going to move on to the next section. So the last part that uh, HMIP looked at uh, and they were particularly interested in is the uh, area of resettlement. So sort of just explain to you all this wasn't uh, an area that had been or was going to be considered as an overall assessment and wouldn't have impacted our overall um, scoring. Uh, but what we had done at the time is developed a draft policy. Now, uh, this was a very new area that uh, HMIP was going to be looking into. So at the time, a number of uh, youth justice services were in the same situation and were developing a policy. So uh, it, it didn't impact the overall outcome, but it was something they wanted to consider and look at uh, and, and obviously felt that it was an area of work that we needed to embed and focus on next. OK, so the key findings for that particular bit that uh, we recognise this is an area of development and gathered children's views uh, that we needed to develop our resettlement policy and protocol and that roles and responsibilities needed to be established, including that of partner agencies, and that includes specifically probation in terms of uh, the young person moving to an adult transition and then improved communications between the youth justice service and partner agencies regarding the resettlement process. I'll refer to this in the action and improvement plan, but obviously we're looking at this area specifically. And one of the things that we are focusing on next is setting up a resettlement panel, which is uh, which hopefully will help us to address the particular improvements in this aspect. OK, so so we've pulled together on this presentation the overarching recommendations. And what I'll just explain is these recommendations have then been transferred on to the action and improvement plan for you to see. In total, uh, there were eight identified. Um, so key bits to sort of just refer to. One was about developing clear guidance and processes for resettlement, uh, working with managers, practitioners, uh, so that the expectations of prevention work are understood, providing training to staff so that they're confident in working with children who have engaged in sexually harmful behaviour, improving the quality of planning to address risks to and from the child, ensuring that the actual and potential victims be considered and their effective contingency arrangements. So that's for the service itself and specifically for the board. Work with the Youth Justice Service to develop an understanding of diversity and disproportionality within its cohort and identify how the needs of these children will be met. Raising the profile of the service within board member services to ensure that the needs of Youth Justice Service children and young people are understood and prioritised and supporting the Youth Justice Service in prioritising and addressing access to appropriate facilities to see children. 
I'll come to the bit about appropriate facilities in the action and improvement plan because there's some really positive news to share with you, but I'll come to that in a little bit. So just in terms of next steps, then uh, one of the tasks that we obviously had to do was develop an action and improvement plan, which then was submitted on the 1st of March. I'm pleased to obviously say that that's been submitted, which is why I'll be discussing that uh, in a minute. Uh, and obviously, I'm equally pleased to say that um, HMIP have accepted the plan and are happy with it and obviously given it uh, their agreement. And obviously, that's the, the reason why the letter was then sent through to scrutiny. And I apologise about the timing, but unfortunately, we'd only just recently received it. OK, the other next step then, uh, in terms of my uh, best hopes would be um, that we can then bring this back to scrutiny in six months time to review the plan and for you to consider it. And then we can give you a further update if that's OK. Just give yourself a little rest a minute. Do you want to come in there, Yvonne? Uh, thanks, Chair. It was Let just me just a... stop sharing. Apologies all. There we are. A question I wanted to ask Jay, where it talks about uh, this push nationality and ethnicity what does that mean so so uh, it's this is an interesting area of on because at the time when helen and i looked at the data and we were talking to hmip our data wasn't really indicating that we were as a service not supporting or representing underrepresented groups so as you can imagine that would include uh, children young people who have lgbtq plus needs or girls particularly or those from black ethnic communities so obviously any bame and and at the time when we discussed this our data wasn't really highlighting that the service had an over representation of, of oh. children and young people who had those needs however it, it just to sort of put into context hmip are particularly interested in disproportionality and it's been a, a reoccurring theme across other youth justice services who've been inspected and my understanding is it's a particular um area they would like to take forward and they wanted us as a service to drive forward so i mean i can uh, respond to you yvonne and just confirm that helen and i have already implemented a number of different things at the moment the team have recently had training on unconscious bias and culture which has been very very helpful in fact i got to sit in on part of that would have liked to have stayed for the whole thing um, and we have obviously set up champions in the service now who are taking forward and driving forward particular work around raising awareness around lgbtq plus bame and and specifically I, mean, I was just thinking the other part is about our local policy response what we have to do next helen and i on our uh, on our plan now need to set up a local policy with our partners to see how we can address that and um, hmip were particularly interested in not just how the service responds to the needs but actually are our staff trained up and are they aware and, and know how to respond to them. So it was a bit of a two pronged approach. They wanted to address the needs of children and young people, but also make sure that staff understood how best to respond, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. I wasn't quite sure what was meant by the statement. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. No, no problem. And I appreciate you asking. Okay. okay, if it's okay with you, what I will do next, I'm not going to overload you with too much detail, but I just want to give you a quick oversight of the action improvement plan. And I'm only going to touch on some of the key bits of activity that have been going on. Is that okay with you? Is that okay, Chair? Yeah, that's fine, Jay. Just to let you know, there is a Welsh version available for you. I'm happy to send that to you, but obviously, uh, apologies because I'm English speaking. Uh, I can only res respond to you in the English version. Is that OK? Yeah. Okay, lovely. So I'll just share this with you. What I wanted to do is just focus on some of the highlight points, if that's OK with you. So I'll just go to the top. As I said, in total, there are eight points. And what I've tried to do is we will be monitoring and reviewing this plan every month. So Helen and I get together and we also monitor and review this in a number of forums. And what we'll have identified in the plan, you'll see where um, where we will be reviewing this on a number of different uh, in a number of different areas. Most importantly to share with you, we've got no reds. So uh, there are eight ambers, which effectively says to you that we've started all of the work around the recommendations. So I'm pleased to say that there's nothing that needs immediate priority. It's all being worked on at this moment in time. And just to sort of share a couple of things, one of the recommendations was about developing clear guidance around resettlement and, and collaboration with partners. As I've already said, we do have a resettlement policy in place. It's a draft policy, but obviously what we will be doing at this next stage is just making sure that we incorporate disproportionality into that piece of work to make sure it's being considered. 
And the other thing I mentioned that was a highlight was that we are setting up a resettlement and reintegration panel and we'll be joining up with partners and they'll be included in that panel to make sure that any young person who is uh, coming back into the community is obviously released from custody, that we will have an appropriate plan and an escalation process to make sure that their needs are being met. By the way, if you want to ask me questions at any point in time, um, feel free to jump in. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, the next section uh, is about working with managers and practitioners. So the expectations of the prevention work are understood. I'm very excited to tell you that we've got a systems review taking place. So we're going to be relooking at the whole of the youth justice service as of uh, as of March. We're currently in the process of doing the preparation work at the moment, but I'm very excited because it means the whole service will be involved, including children and young people and parent carers. And they're going to be helping us to shape and redesign the service to make sure that it's it's a fit for purpose and meeting the needs of children and young people and achieving what matters. So it's a very, very exciting opportunity. Uh, other things that I just wanted to highlight, Helen and I had already had a team development session with the team to look at communication about how we can support them to effectively come to talk to the board and have more helpful conversations with us. But it was also, I think I think we'd reflected that actually some of the team uh, had needed sort of support to work through a previous culture that the team had operated by. So it was about supporting them and motivating them to get to the new point and, and be on the journey. OK, so the next section, so this is about providing training to staff so that they're confident in working with children who are engaged in sexually harmful behaviour. Uh, Mike, this is the point that I was sort of making reference to earlier. We have already set up AIM3 training, which is a very specialised sexual uh, risk assessment training and intervention training course. Uh, We've had a couple of members of staff from the service already who've been trained and now we're uh, broadening the offer out to the whole service and I've already linked in with some of my colleagues across child and family to offer out that training uh, to, to obviously my, my colleagues within child and family so that there is a take up across the service. Uh, the next part can is I jump, can I jump in there. Of course you can. Okay, sorry, just, just to, to, to illustrate what was done previously. I remember that the Faithful Foundation training I'm saying was done probably 25 years ago starting off and that was um people on the inside professionals people who had jobs working in social services health education and then it was cascaded out um in an appropriate and a safe way to uh, service users and people engaged in community activities sports clubs faith organizations to spot the signs and that's where the magic happened there it, it kind of cascaded and went horizontal uh it was really fascinating to see i remember a we had a load of uh, young mums undertaking the courses and they were just bowled over by by the training experience. It was, it was brilliant, really. Okay. Sorry, I thought that was no, a no, place really graphic helpful. like what was done previously. Sorry. Yeah, no, to, my, my, no, no, that's really helpful. It, it sounds there and, and I hope I've got this right. So absolutely right. What you're saying is how can we be engaging our communities more in this and actually upskilling them to be more aware? So absolutely take your point there. And, and that's a conversation that Helen and I will definitely be having after scrutiny. So thank you for raising that. OK, so the next part is just to confirm we will be dip sampling and auditing cases where sexually harmful behaviour has been identified. We already work very closely uh, with the safeguarding components within uh, Child and Family and Kelly Shannon in particular. Uh, we work very closely with. We already have a dedicated practice lead in the service whose responsibility is is actually to be focusing on this particular component. So I just want to assure scrutiny that we will be continuing with that process and we will be doing regular auditing. If this also gets discussed at the um, uh, via the safeguarding board, but actually part of the quality assurance uh, and policy and procedures task groups that I'm part of, which feed into the safeguarding board. So I just want you to know there's there's some strong interlinks uh, with our existing regional board. Um, the next part, very briefly, about improving the quality of planning to address risks to and from children, uh, ensuring actual and potential victims have been considered and their effective uh, contingency arrangements. Just to sort of share with you, uh, when we referred earlier to this specific area around out of court disposals, Helen and I, uh, or Helen really uh, should take the credit for this, she's setting up workshops with the team to specifically address this particular area. And there'll be a review, particularly focusing on well-being, planning, and then looking at the impact uh, on actual, uh, uh, sorry, the impact on victims and the potential impact on victims. So sort of just to say this work is already being started and there's already a timetable of, of, of workshops planned in place. Uh, 
The other thing just to share with you then is that we already have monthly risk panels which are now in place to support staff to identify risk to others and the risk to children and young people um, and this will be I mean it's definitely multi-agency focused we have multi-agency partners around the table but it's obviously to make sure that the planning process is effective as it can be. The next section then, working with police to develop robust quality assurance and out of court disposal processes. As I said, the, the kind of frustrating bit about this is that we'd already um, started to implement a regional quality assurance panel. Unfortunately, the panel just didn't start at the same time as the inspection and actually it's it's taken place since and I can report it's been a very, very positive experience. We have representatives from the court, we have police representatives, uh, child and family services, we also have representatives from the justice service. Um, and I think we were even talking about potentially uh, having further conversations about other multi-agency partners to be included. So I just want to let you know it's been a very positive experience. I just wish it had taken place a little bit sooner. Um, and the other key bit, as I've already referred to, is that Helen now sits on the Bureau process and has direct oversight. And, and, I, and I gather, and I'm sure Helen would confirm, that's been a, an extremely positive and helpful process in terms of uh, reviewing. I, th I think the key bit, sort of just to share with everyone, um, and, and I know we've spoken to our police colleagues about this, HMI, HMIP, uh, I think have across the board, across Wales, queried uh, the existing out of court disposal process. And I think they have a view about the Bureau and would like to see it as a as a more uh, as a less police led process and uh, and more uh, jointly led by partners. So I think they're very keen for us to take that process forward. And I've already had conversations with my police colleagues to look at that, particularly to see if there's anything we can do to be working more closely together. So it's an exciting opportunity. OK, the next section, uh, we've talked about this already, about understanding diversity and disproportionality, so I won't repeat uh, what we've covered there already. Um, oh, sorry, Jay, I think Helen had her hand up. I oh, thank you. Apologies, oh. all. I can't see. I can't see. I do apologise. It's all right, Jay, I forgive you. It's OK. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just want I just wanted to wonder if it would be helpful. I just wanted to... Um, I just while Jay was talking about the act of court disposals and conscious of... Um, the earlier very relevant question in respect to that. I, I wondered whether it would be helpful just for me to point out that when young people go before the Bureau, the Bureau have the option, uh, uh, sort of three options really, in terms of um, outcomes for those young people. And what HMIP um, inspectorate were very clear with us on is that they had absolutely no issue in any of the cases that they looked at they wouldn't complete agreement in terms of the outcomes for each of those young people. And I do think it is really important that that everybody understands that. So the, the, the concerns weren't in relation to what was happening at Bureau and the outcomes and, the, and what was happening for those young people. It seemed to be more to do with exactly what, what we're referring to, which is around just making sure that we have that oversight, that really clear oversight, and that, we're, that we are confident that assessments are as they should be, that risk assessments are covering everything that they should. And I think they were just feeling that they wanted that additional oversight, which as Jay has, has stated, we have now put in place. But I just wanted to be clear that the outcomes weren't, um, weren't something that they were concerned about. Thank, Helen, thank you for clarifying that and thank you for sharing that. I think that's really important, to be honest with you. OK. We're literally nearly the end. So sort of just to say one of the uh, other areas is about raising the profile of the service and and uh, as part of the action and improvement plan, uh, We've, we've definitely been stressing to our partners that we need to make sure that this, the profile of the service is being raised at their particular relevant boards. Um, one of the things we've also talked about is the service then almost doing a bit of a road show and going back around to service services and to partners to sort of talk about the service. Um, and the other key bit uh, that we have talked about is about board members uh, actively being invited to on a regular basis and rotating and coming to see the service to talk to staff and children and young people directly and one of the things that was going to suggest is if scrutiny are in agreement we'd like to extend that offer to uh, members of scrutiny if they would like to come and talk to staff members and children and young people they're very welcome to so that's definitely something we wanted to consider today and the last section I think we're we're nearly there yes so this is about uh, and what i'm really excited to really be sharing with scrutiny is the last point is about prioritizing and addressing access to appropriate facilities uh, for children and young people 
HMIP specifically focused on what they felt were challenges in terms of access to buildings for young people. And we did explain to them at the time that some of the issues were because we were responding to uh, Welsh Government guidance, the buildings uh, were very carefully being managed. We couldn't uh, exceed numbers, so we had to try and support children and young people um, obviously through uh, appropriately risk assessed uh, plans. But actually one of the difficulties was that they were identifying that staff up, there weren't sufficient building spaces to be used. Now, again, unfortunately, at the time that we'd had the inspection, we were just going through the process of um, renewing or, or changing the restrictions. And I think they'd, they'd, they'd um, been reduced and we were going through the process with health and safety and with the unions to increase capacity again. But unfortunately, this was just at the same time that the inspection took place so we have increased capacity and I'm pleased to say um, we're even going to another meeting now to look at increasing our numbers again which is fantastic but the most important bit of news to share with everybody is this that we're going to be investing um, some additional uh, money uh, into purchasing a new youth justice building so currently we have two buildings we have the main building in Deneva which is in the centre of town and there's one uh, in, in in our industrial site which is primarily um, the intervention centre that young people get to access however what we're really keen to do is to bring the whole thing together in one location um, so that children and young people have a much better more improved space to be able to come and access support and services from so really excited about that and we're in the process of looking at appropriate buildings at the moment and happy to feedback report to uh, scrutiny once we've completed that uh, project but obviously that's uh, the most significant bit uh, and as I've already highlighted, the service has continued to revise uh, the restrictions and look at those restrictions. And when we've had the ability to and Welsh Government guidance has changed, we obviously are then increasing access to the building for children and young people. And I can definitely confirm that we are working towards a more business as usual approach at the moment. So I think that's everything. Apologies all if I have gone through too quickly. I don't mean to, but I really hope um, that gave you as much information as you felt you needed. Uh, thank you, Jay. I, as you say, there's an awful lot of information there, and it takes a bit of taking. David, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks to Jay and uh, Helen. Not not just for the report to scrutiny. You know, I just want to remind scrutiny members. Jay touched on it at the beginning. The previous absolutely damning is the only way of describing it. Uh, inspection result we had. Um, prior to, to to this late was was when we you know were in a, a regional arrangement. I think at that time it was the worst inspection of a yoss in Wales there'd ever been. So we started from a particularly low base of disaggregating the regional service, bringing the service back in um, house, uh, you know, rebuilding a team, putting in place new management, you know, which Jay and Helen are, are the most, um, um, uh, you know, sig significant senior leaders that we had in place. Um, starting a management board again, um, pretty much starting from scratch. So starting point is the most inadequate inspection result that ever been in Wales. And then moving into an improvement, you know, an improvement journey. But of course, in the intervening period, COVID hit and that has caused you know massive challenges not just for um, for the YOS service but you know clearly for all our services for our local population for our children young people so it would have been something of a surprise to me if we had had an inspection report now you know uh, that, that that didn't still you know present us with some learning and some challenges to overcome having said that I was still I still and I still struggle today, even as Jay was presenting when he presents the report and the ratings and then you see the list of positives that the inspector, you know, the, the inspectors set out and then the things that we needed to work on. I still look at the overall positives thinking it's quite hard to interpret that into why does it then come with such a low rating if you get and, and Jay explained that in that effectively the regime that they follow scores you at the lowest point so if you've still got a challenge then your overall rating comes out at the lowest point which is quite a deficit approach to take but yeah. nevertheless it is what it is 
the other key thing, and, and Helen touched a bit on it, even in the areas, so the, you know, I, I was most struggling with, hang on, we got an area that still come out as inadequate. I could, I could just about accept needs improvement because we started from a low base. You know, we had COVID in the intervening period. The inadequate really shocked me because it didn't fit with my understanding of, you know, how we were supporting young people. Um, but Helen's point around that, no, their actual feedback on the on the work that took place with the young people and the outcomes that were delivered, they were all fine with all of that. Um, which, you know, from frankly, from my starting point, you know, that's the first thing that I look for. And again, I'll, I'll emphasise it when. When we when we were in the the feedback from the regional uh, the inspection of the regional yoss arrangement, about half a dozen cases were referred back to us, with the inspectors saying, "We have immediate concerns about these children and young people having looked at the work that that was taking place with them." We had no cases referred back during, you know, so all of the work that they looked at, for in terms of if you just focused on. How are we supporting these children and young people? Nothing in what the inspectors fed back to us suggested that they found any concerns about that work. And that's really where I start from as, you know, the most important thing for me. And so I was alarmed when I saw inadequate because I was thinking, Christ, you know, goodness me, does that, does that mean we have been failing some children, young people? And somehow as chair of the management board, I've overlooked that. Oh, we haven't, you know, we haven't. I've been, you know, we've we've been not concentrating on the right things in the, uh, you know, in the in the management board. This isn't me saying that I don't accept absolutely all of the recommendations uh, for improvement, and I'm really pleased that so quickly such a comprehensive improvement plan has been put in place. Has already gone back to the inspectorate. They fully endorse that, as you've seen a copy of the of the letter coming back. We will make those improvements. Um, you know, I, I am still of the view that the place that we started and the concentrating first and foremost on making sure that services to children, and young people who are at risk of or are being brought into the criminal justice system, you know, are those services, you know, and support in place and impacting positively for the, those young people. I, I'm still sitting here confident based on everything that we've received at the management board, every all of the feedback from the inspector that that is, you know, that that we can accept as yet that 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 very at that very basic but most important level, that improvement has been made. And it wasn't the case when we were in the regional arrangement. That was the feedback we had. And that's been achieved despite the fact that we have had massive disruption as a result of um, uh, of COVID. I'll just emphasise that a little bit more in terms of when the inspectorate published their report, the press statement they put out, and I don't know whether members of scrutiny read that, um, and if we haven't circulated it, we should. Again, I read it thinking, it, you know, from what is in the press statement from the lead inspector, I was reading it thinking, that's fantastic. All of this really good stuff that they're describing in the, you know, in in terms of the improvements that they have seen uh, when they've come and inspected us, near, you know, now, which is pretty much all that the press statement focused on. And, it, you know, quite a lengthy press statement, overwhelmingly positive, but with a headline that said, Swansea Your Service Needs Improvement. So, the, you know, it's just, I, I still struggle with that. But this isn't me saying that we don't fully accept the recommendations that have um, uh, that have made, and as um, Jay and and Helen have um, taken us through, the plan in place to make those improvements um, is absolutely robust. Um, so, so you know, just thanks again to Jay and Helen, but that and their team. That thanks though isn't just about the report to scrutiny. It is all of their astonishing hard work over the last few years. Um, you know, Jay and Helen have led that and our workforce have been fantastic in the most difficult of, um, you know, over the most difficult period. And I wouldn't want that headline around needs improvement, you know, to in any way, you know, for staff or, or Helen or Jay to interpret that as they haven't done a bloody fantastic job because they have. 
I'll stop there, Chair. Okay, thanks, David. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so I'll also say thank you to Jay and Helen for the presentation, and I will throw it open for questions if anybody has any. I'm not seeing any hands go up here at the moment. So it looks like you might have got away with it, Jay, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Des, you want to come in. Sorry, I thought you had then, Jay, but my apologies. Not quite, just a quick comment, Chair. And it's basically to take up what David have said, really. Um, from a point of view, it's better to have a headline that draws attention to something, saying that it that it needs improvement than for a headline to say everything's wonderful and it's not quite wonderful. And it goes back to the previous report, which I think Eve uh, took the same line on. If if it, 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 it's a case of taking the positives out of it, isn't it? And, and taking it as an opportunity to address the negatives and, and, and therefore improving the situation rather than to think everything's wonderful when perhaps quite it's not. Thank you, Des. Uh, anybody want to come back on that? No, absolutely fair, fair point, um, um, Des. And I agree with you. And I'll stress again, this isn't me saying that we don't fully accept those recommendations. But the thing all of us, you know, three years ago, all of us sitting in this panel, the thing that we were most rightly most devastated about was, you know, that these were, you know, not not just process things that were being described. The description was we were letting down our children and young people. And I want to emphasize that nothing in this inspection has suggested that that continues to be the case in Swansea. Um, and, you know, and, and for me, that is the most important thing. But we take on the chin. There are improvements to be made. There always will be. Even yeah. if the inspection had come back and said good, there still would have been a list of things for us to improve. Yeah. Even if it said we were exceptional, there still would have been a list of things to improve. And um, you know, and that is our approach, isn't it? That's the approach that that this panel is always advocated over many, many years. So absolutely agree with you, you, good. you Des. Good. Um, but particularly that message to staff, I wouldn't want staff to think that uh, you know any of us are sitting here or me sitting there as chair of the management board not absolutely commending them for all the efforts they've made during this really difficult period and the fact that we've moved from what was a very damning report to a report that says needs improvement with, but with a whole long list of very positive comments is a huge achievement yeah good well it's good for them to hear you say that Dave yeah Yes, uh, I. when I was introduced this, I was going to say, I must admit, I didn't look at my notes closely enough, I was going to say that it was back in March 2019, I think, that we had what was a major critical report. And from everything that you're telling us now, David, we've obviously come a very long way, so I'll thanks to Jay and Helen on that. Having said that, of course, we will continue. I'm sure this, I, sorry, I can't say that. I'm sure this scrutiny panel will continue to monitor that going forward. Um, but thank you very much for your presentation and thank you very much for being here. And thank yeah, you very much yeah. for the process you're making. Um, yeah, yeah. Elliot, do you want to come in and say something? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just just really very briefly, I think I think Dave made some really good points there around around the you know around the report and and where we're at. And um I know Jay made the offer in the presentation to members of scrutiny to to have that opportunity to interact with staff and young people and I really would encourage people to take that on board just just because I know I know there are some here who who've done that as as you know as part of the boards and committees and I think it's a really valuable thing so I think Kevin would be really welcome to take up that opportunity so you know please do get in touch um, I'm going to be doing it myself um, as well so um, but yeah that, that's all I wanted to add thank you chair okay thank you Elliot uh, if there are no, in, not any more questions, then I will move on to the next item on the agendas. I haven't said already, thank you very much to Jay and Helen for that last section. Item 8 is a verbal update on emergency staffing. Elliot, are you going to come in on this? Or is it going to be Dave? I've got 
according to this so, GP, Ju Judy probably would come in yeah yeah if that's okay chat uh, come in on that um so I'm pleased to say that um since the I talked about this at last scrutiny although we haven't the position on recruiting social workers hasn't particularly changed too much although there is a slight positive upward trend on that we're not where we need to be but because we continue to take a whole service approach to supporting um, our priority area around safeguarding in these locality teams uh, we don't have any unallocated cases um, assessment and visit timeliness continues to be on an upward trend more broadly and we have um, I've taken the decision to recruit more support workers and that's having a positive benefit on the social workers feeling less pressured and being able to focus on those core social worker tasks that they um, are there to do particularly around court work and um, child protection conference in so um, so that that's really uh, good for us um, we continue on the longer term we could talk about this in more detail at, at ne next um, municipal year thinking more strategically about if this issue with recruiting social workers is going to continue then what do we need to do strategically to position ourselves to think about what that would mean in relation to how our services operate in the future um, and that's something we can to look at on a regional and an all Wales basis um, but locally although we haven't particularly been successful in, in recruiting a great number of more social workers we have been successful in recruiting more support workers and that will really bolster out one of our aims and our ambitions to career progress people to become qualified social workers in the future um, and the other piece of good news i wanted to share is that we have um, been successful in being, being able to reactivate the business as usual performance report the more detailed report so when we come back in the next musical year we'll be able to go back to revert back to the more detailed report in there we shall then incorporate the staffing component into that going forward so i'm very pleased about that uh, it's all down to the efforts of the learning improvement team but also the wicked the local wiki support team that we've been able to to achieve that uh, just very recently thank you chair okay thank you julie um i don't know if there's any questions in terms of anybody has in respect to that pleased to hear that the wccis system is beginning to settle down i must admit because it has been obviously a concern for you know, some of the problems that it has caused and if that's easing then that's going to be positive for you um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I will say very much thank you to all the officers who've been here today for the presentations. Um, They've be basically been two very important subjects, I think, um, that have arisen over the last couple of years in this sense. Well, it has been quite an important meeting in that respect. I think, by and large, the uh, <coughs> feedback that we've given, been getting as a scrutiny committee is that in both areas, we have been making significant improvement. I'm sure the scrutiny board will <coughs> going forward will want to ensure that we can continue to monitor that sort of improvement. So thank you very much, the officers. Uh, I've got one item left on the agenda, which basically is for the members of this scrutiny panel. If officers and uh, <coughs> uh, and councillors who are not or, or particularly on this uh, panel want to leave then fine you're free to do so we're going to have a quick look at ourselves and see just how well we think we've been doing over the last 12 months or so and any recommendations we got going forward thank you very much thank you chair and i will move on to item nine or oh, one thing i should have said before we're we gone we're we gone are they are we gone my apologies um basically then item nine is the panel and what we've been doing for the last 12 months uh, in terms of our assessment of how effective we've been. Four questions there in point one, two of the agenda pack. What went well, what did not go so well, has the work focused on the right things and what have we learned that will help us with future child and family services scrutiny? Any thoughts? Or quiet on the Western Front, he said. Sorry, Chair, I, I, I'm trying to put my hand up, but I, my finger doesn't want to work. It's fed up and tired, I think. <laughs> Can okay. I say that, uh, just re to reiterate the point that I made earlier, really, um, I think this is the most important aspect of public service design and delivery uh, uh, above all others because of the vulnerability of the 
the population that we target, trying to support and work with children and families. And I think that, um, you know, I, I've never seen in, in my time on this panel any sense of complacency. And I've seen a very robust focus with all committee members and and supported by the officers. So it, it, there's, it's difficult for me to think about how we can improve that robust, na the robust nature of the scrutiny that we carry out. Um, so I think that I just want to say that because I think it's important sometimes because because they, they can these meetings always feel tense and kind of challenging because the nature of what we do that's always going to be the same, isn't it? But yeah. uh, I think that uh, you know it's worth pausing and reflecting and say kind of you know uh, pat in the chair on the back and committee members for uh, what I think is very proactive uh, and very important scrutiny function. Um. That's that, Mike. I, uh, <coughs> you are relatively new, I think, to this committee, Mike, and you've just put your hand up because I was going to ask you your views in that sense as well, because of uh, being comparatively new, as they say. Yeah, I, th I think I totally agree with what Mike has said, is that we haven't shirked from um, dealing with the difficult issues and being challenging. Uh, but I think the things that have worked well, from my point of view, is actually the kind of um, direct engagement with um, client groups, if I can call it that, if I can use that kind of um, phrase, either, you know, children, young people coming along directly and addressing us or, you know, some of those videos that were done with um, uh, young mums, you know, which I, th I thought was really, really powerful. Um, so it would be good if we could in future to be able to build on that. Um, clearly, the um, uh, the workload, um, you know, and, uh, Mike is, is quite right. You know, this is such an important area, isn't it? That um, uh, it, it may even require uh, some form of, um, uh, dare I say it, you know, more regular meetings because there's such an awful lot of um, ground to cover. Um, I am conscious of the fact that, and I think we've had this discussion with Julie in the past, is that um, we don't want the officers to be preparing statistical reports or whatever. Um, just on the basis of you know giving us some sort of um, feedback, um, you know I, I suppose just to pick up the point I made earlier on in the discussion is that you know all the inputs and the processes are important, but for me it's actually the the outcomes. You know what 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 impact is all this having uh, upon the uh, lives of children and young people for whom we have a responsibility? So um, yeah, it's it's kind of trying to get that balance right, and it may be that. You know, when when after the election we're able to get together face to face, um, then we're able then to have some form of um, conference, as it were, to uh, just look at some of these issues. But um, yeah, it's 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 been um, been good, and I've benefited from it. And obviously, from my point of view, because um, you know, like a couple of others on the education scrutiny performance committee as well, being able to see the linkages between the two. So I was pleased to see Kate there today, and um, you know, just thank you to. Those of you who are standing down, I see uh, Des, you know, so, um, you know, thanks for your uh, engagement and involvement as well. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, I got Mike's hand back up and I got Des as well. Um, can, can I say, uh, to yeah. echo what Mike said, really, I mean, you know, the, the idea of, of of Swansea Council without Des Thomas just does not, doesn't compete for me. And I don't like the idea at all, if I'm perfectly honest with that, but I'm not going to think about that. Um, you will be sorely missed. Um, Mike, I, I think that's right. And I think that I said in previous committee meetings, suggested that when we have those dozens of pages, performance pages, there's lots of information, lots of data. Are we seeing the wood through the trees? That's my um, feeling, you know, what's the most important? What's the most? And when I asked previously about the, the tools and techniques, and I think then that led to the, the networking, that those practical real world examples, you know, the, those videos, I think that was so powerful because it helped us to see, I mean, what do you actually do and say and suggest in the most challenging circumstances most of us would never have experienced in our lives. And, and that related, well, as you spoke, Mike, it related to me to the idea that every single month we don't celebrate enough the success. Uh, and uh, and here, this is for the cabinet member predominantly, I think, we don't celebrate the, the success that we see in all the cases that get closed every month. You know, there's dozens every month of these cases that are closed because of the brilliant intervention from the service that that's designed and delivered. So those lessons coming out more would be really beneficial for me because it really is life changing 
and incredibly powerful for families. And apologies from me for any confusion caused by having another Mike D in the committee. I know it is very confusing, <laughs> especially for Chairman. Des, you wanted to say something? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Chair. Thanks for those uh, kind words, the members. Um, yeah, I, I will miss it, but it, but it's the workings are in good hands. But if I can just refer to, um, to to what we've achieved, if I can put it that way, over the period of time, I think the department is working better now because of us than it would have otherwise. And if I can be as succinct as that, I think that's all that needs to be said to be done. We've we've covered a range of topics, um, but the fact that we are here, or the fact that we've been here, been meeting, been going over the um, the different aspects of child and uh, uh, care for, um, and having the the. The service at the top of our minds, I think, has made a difference to the efficiency of the department. And if we've done that, and if it has made a difference to a child's life out there, then, you know, we've been successful in, in our operation. So thanks, Chair. I'll say no more. Thank you. Nice to Erica? Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I, I can't really follow that. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we're going to miss you, Des. But, you know, this um, child and family, family scrutiny panel, for me, has been absolutely exceptional. And I'll tell you what Des says, because it's the individuals, the drivers, and um, credit to the chair. We've brought things and put it on the table, and he hasn't put it under the table. He's put them on the table and some of these things have been horrendous. And I think that's our strength, OK? It's looking at the dreadful things because we want to make a difference to one child's life. Those are the, That's the important. That's our ground, where we're coming from, um, to make a difference to those families. And I think um, the strength is don't be afraid of what's coming ahead because there's going to be a lot more coming ahead that we don't even think about at the minute, but I'm sure that's true. So um, I, I want to say it's been a strong scrutiny. I think it's made a difference. I've been proud to be part of it and um, to see... And the reports are good because we're not all getting this glory stuff, are we? We're getting the reality and we know where we are with that. We know what we can do then and the steps that have to take um, be taken. So just thank you, Paxton. Thank you, team. I think it's been a really good programme. Thank you, Erica. Wendy? Uh, um, I'm not going to talk because I, I can hardly talk. Um, just want to echo what everyone says. I mean, a past, Paxton, you've been amazing. I, I got to be honest. I'm going to be truthful. You've been good, and you you don't you don't criticise. You try to to ask questions and and good questions. And as Erica says, it is the reality. I was one of those children. I am the reality on you. That's why I do keep myself quiet when you're going through a lot of things. Um, so to me, it's, it's amazing that these children are getting the help through scrutiny. So, uh, and it's just, you know, I'm gobsmacked by it all. So, thank you, Wendy. Much appreciated. Your hand is still up, Des. Did you want to come back? Sorry, historic. Legacy hand. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, Certainly, I would tend to agree. I think uh, that what we do is useful. I know that those of us who've been involved with it for some time have seen the department go from a situation where they were in a dire, yeah, yeah. dire straits to where they are now. And yeah. that, of course, is all basically down to the management and the staff at the end of the day. Our role always has been is to be a critical friend, I think, is the mm. best way to put it. That is a role of scrutiny. I would like to express my appreciation to everybody who's contributed to that on this uh, panel. I have to say that and to say thank you very much. I know you're leaving us, Des, um, and we will miss you in that sense. 
those of us who are back anyway, we'll miss you, that's for sure. Um, those of us who are not, won't miss you in that sense, but that's another matter. Um, for those who are standing again, I will wish them all the best and hope they are successful. Um, the other thing I have to say in terms of this, we are, I think, reasonably effective as a scrutiny panel, but that is also reflects the amount of work that Liz puts in as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to make that point to her and say to Liz, thank you very much for all you do. From a chairman's point of view or convener's point of view, I should say, a lot of the work is done for you or you just come along and uh, <coughs> and run a meeting and that's the end of it almost. Not quite as simple as that, but I do appreciate and I have appreciated that I put that on the record before and I think it applies to all the scrutiny staff anyway. I've said that publicly as well, but thank you very much, Liz, for all that you do for us. Or all you we'll do all be us. crying you... now. Pardon? <laughs> no. We'll anyway. all be crying now, I said. On that, on that basis, I think perhaps it is probably time I close the meeting before we have floods everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well done, everyone. Uh, yeah, well done. Thanks, thanks Maxton. Thank you. Well done. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, you're on as well. Everyone's coming back in. Okay. Ta-da. Hey, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.